All right, so we've seen an overview of the uh, wastewater treatment plant for Richmond at Otter Creek. And the three major functions of the wastewater treatment plant are to remove the solids from our wastewater stream, uh, including removing the sludge, to remove the organic matter and any pollutants, and also to make sure that there's oxygen back in that water, back into that effluent before we return it to a stream or river. Now, I provide some videos on Blackboard that describe how the wastewater gets from the community to the wastewater plant. And in some cases, the wastewater has to go up hills and then gravity feed downhill. So how does that happen? Well, how does it get uphill? Well, it flows downhill to a can or an underground kind of storage area. That area has a pump in it, and we call that the lift station, and there's a lift pump that then pumps the sewage up to a higher elevation, and then it can go back down gravity feed to another point. So those are called lift pumps. They often also grind up or break down the waste as well. And um, these have to be maintained over a period of time. These can become very corrosive. Um, well, the metals can corrode very easily, so they have to be maintained. Um, we know that they can overflow if the pumps go bad, so they have lights on them to warn us. Um, there's a little antenna sometimes on them that sends a radio signal or a telephone call saying, hey, I'm overflowing, come do something. So sometimes the pumps fail, they get clogged by stuff. People have flushed like clothes down the toilet. Um, there's uh, other reasons why they may fail. Um, it may rain a lot and there might be a lot of broken pipes and they just keep running continuously as fast, as fast as they can and the pump overheats. Or the amount of water coming into the pipe exceeds what the, what the pump can pump out. So the alarm comes on when the elevation gets too high um, inside this. There's a great video on the main lift pump at the beginning of a wastewater treatment plant. So um, at the beginning of the wastewater treatment plant at this high point, we have to sometimes get the wastewater up to that high point and that pump controls the speed at which waste moves through the process. And in general, more time means a better, a better treatment or a better quality product at the end. So these pumps have a very tough job. There's a video on Blackboard from Dirty Jobs that shows you the work that these lift, lift station pumps have to do and what it's like to change a lift pump at a huge wastewater treatment plant. So again, these pumps, uh, this one's kind of a controlled environment here. Many times the pumps are actually what you would see is in a uh, more uh, nasty environment. These pumps uh, control the flow and the movement of wastewater throughout the process. They create head. So head is that head pressure, you know, the elevation. So you raise the water up and then that can flow downhill from there. So they create the head um, and the head works, you know, I'm going to skip that. Um, there's different ways of measuring them. Um, there's old fashioned ways they had weirs um, where they had, you know, you could tell how fast something's moving through there. Um, nowadays, you've got flow meters that are built into it. So when the wastewater plant's built, the engineers have built it to where you can monitor the flow from a distance. You can even monitor the flow from a telephone or from the computer at the office. So wastewater treatment involves several steps. There's primary treatment, which is anaerobic. Secondary treatment is the minimum required by the Clean Water Act. So we have to oxygenate our wastewater. So that is secondary treatment when we add the oxygen. Tertiary treatment is a, an expensive uh, thing to do and not always affordable, but it's something that occasionally has to do be done as well. Primary treatment is largely mechanical and physical, and it's also, um, in many cases, I'd say anaerobic. And primary treatment removes the suspended solids by 60%. It 
It reduces the BOD, it reduces that demand for oxygen by at least 35 to 40%, and it reduces the amount of organics by 40 to 50%. So it does a fairly good job just using mechanical and physical processes. The first step is the bar screen. So the bar screens are mechanical or stationary, and there's a video about the quote muffin monster, uh, that's a YouTube uh, Dirty Jobs video, that gives you a little taste of what these things have to do. So they remove large floating debris, um, like say plastic bags, um, tampon applicators, um, other things people might flush down the toilet. The water flows through these screens um, and you can see the types of things that get stuck on these. A lot of plastics, uh, even flushable wipes that make it through the process can get stuck on here if they don't, are, are the non-degradable kinds of flushable wipes that are really problematic. So they hit this screen and this screen kind of operates like a giant conveyor belt. And as it twists at the top and turns, it then drops off whatever it was containing. So here's an example of a bar screen. And then as it turns right here, the solid matter that's on it can come kind of flake off as it kind of reverses its direction on this belt. It's kind of like a conveyor belt at a grocery store and as it gets to the end and turns kind of makes the stuff fall out this stuff gets collected in a dumpster and can be hauled off for landfill all right the next step after water moves through the bar screen it then moves into a grit chamber which in many cases has what's called an emhoff shape uh, more like a cone shape and the flow rate you know varies in some cases is a foot per second and this allows things like sand coffee grounds eggshells peanuts peas corn all that to settle out um, this is not probably the best example of a grit chamber the one in richmond is almost like a, a it's circular and you can see the the spinning and it makes it go down here they've done air added some aeration um, I'm not quite certain on the, the, the reasoning for adding the aeration uh, at the grit chamber. Um, I guess they could start treatment earlier. Um, or it's a, you know, there's a lot of different innovative designs that are out there in wastewater. So as long as they're doing secondary treatment and hitting their effluent targets, you know, theoretically it could be permissible. So primary treatment, so we've got kind of this, all this is kind of primary treatment still. Primary treatment also involves primary sedimentation. So after it's done, gone through the bar screens and the grit chamber, it goes into these big basins. Many of these basins are typically 16 feet deep. They're rectangular or circular. And the water or the, the wastewater needs to sit in there for at least one to two hours. And this allows the organic solids to settle out. So you need a lot of space to let this water set here for one to two hours. And this is a primary clarifier. It's anoxic. The fats, oils, and grease will sit on the surface. The sludge will settle to the bottom. The sludge can be collected and hauled off. There are other types of options that are out there. I'm not going to spend much time on that one. But there's secondary treatment after primary treatment. Secondary treatment is bringing the bacteria from primary treatment in the presence of oxygen. And it also brings aerobic bacteria in the presence of oxygen that have contact with the remaining solids in the water. And it's not just bacteria. There are also these small animal-like critters like tardigrades, which aren't always our best ones, but there's a variety of different water bugs that are these small protozoa that eat up the bacteria and they will all get fat and happy and heavy and sink to the bottom and become part of our sludge. Secondary treatment removes a lot of the remaining demand for oxygen and suspended solids. And again, this is required by the Clean Water Act to do secondary treatment. 
There are different options. There are trickling filters, activated sludge. We'll talk about what makes it activated as well as rotating biological contact disc. So how do you give the microbes access to oxygen? How do you oxygenate this stuff over here? Well, trickling filters, which are often sometimes used in the agricultural industry as well, will spray the water. And this spraying process actually creates the opportunity for oxygen to get into it. Again, this releases a lot of gases and may make it smell bad for a long distance. But these are an affordable option. Um, and if you don't have overwhelmingly too much waste to deal with, this can be an option. There's larger trickling filter designs like here. Um, here's one that's in a developing part of the world. Um, so again, you can kind of see the water spraying out there. It's a way of adding oxygen. Trickling filters are low maintenance. They're simple. They, they do everything you need to do, but they do sometimes smell bad. And, um, you know, if it's really cold out, uh, you could imagine that uh, this stuff may start to freeze and that would make it problematic in working. The more common system, the most popular option are these big um, secondary treatment systems that involve aeration, where we actually have, see the pipe there? We actually pump oxygen in. So you can see the pipe down here and you can see all these ways that they're blasting oxygen in through these big air compressors. So activated sludge treatment, we add oxygen and what makes it activated is, is you've got microbes that like oxygen. So these don't smell actually that bad. You wouldn't even know you're at the Madison County Richmond uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, from a distance because you don't really smell. Um, by using the oxygen and, and pushing it all through there, you don't need as much space. You can treat large volumes of wastewater continuously year round. And there's really, again, not much of an odor problem. So people, the neighbors may not even notice it. So that's a good system. There are other systems. These are can be done inside of uh, little huts that maybe help control the temperatures a little bit more. Uh, and you can actually have like these paddle wheels that have biomass grow on disc. And as the water spins on these paddle wheels, you get oxygen to it and you can also get secondary treatment to be accomplished so this is another system again these are typically done indoors um, here's some in a cold climate so after we've done secondary treatment we're almost finished with the hard stuff we need the water to then just settle down for a little bit again so Remember our primary clarifiers before we hit hit them with the, uh, the oxygen at secondary treatment? Well, here we settle the water down again after the oxygen's done hit it, and sludge will continue to settle out. And this removes a lot of the remaining BOD and suspended solids. Secondary clarifiers should have the water set for seven hours. So you need a lot of space dedicated to these. The solids that settle are, are in many cases activated sludge. A lot of that activated sludge will be returned back into the system because it's got all the good microbes in it that we want to support kind of that kind of gut microbiome, in this case, the wastewater microbiome. So we want to keep those bugs in the system. So we may return a certain percentage of the sludge as RAS, return activated sludge. Excess sludge, also known as WAS, or waste activated sludge, is sent to sludge compresses, digesters, gravity thickeners, or however you're going to get rid of your sludge. So the water has sat here for seven hours. The clear water off the top edge goes over to the disinfection part of the wastewater plant. They may add chlorine. Um, and give chlorine at least 32 minutes of contact time. They may also do something else other than adding chlorine. Um, because if you do add chlorine, you have to also pay for the chemical, like maybe sodium thiosulfate, to de dechlorinate the water before you aerate it and send it to the stream. 
we can't be sending chlorinated water out to the stream. So you have to dechlorinate. If you want to avoid chlorination altogether, you can take your really clear water, if it's very clear, and you can use UV disinfection. So the water comes from the secondary clarifier and passes through a whole series of ultraviolet lamps with a UV radiation of about 264 nanometers. That's the wavelength, and it will pass through these UV lamps and that will do the disinfection and then it may then go down some steps like this for aeration and then go to the outfall and be released to your receiving body of water and this waste water that's been treated is known as effluent now we've got all this sludge you may want to thicken the sludge up dry it out do something so there's a variety of ways of dealing with the sludge one of the ways of dealing with the sludge would be, I'm going to move on past some of this stuff, is to do digestion. Digestion, the sludge, this kind of wet, nasty stuff, is piled up in these digesters, and the aerobic back, or the anaerobic bacteria will take over. They will suck all the oxygen out. There won't be any oxygen left. And this is kind of like a giant compost pile. And they make a lot of acid, um, and these acids act as food for bacteria that are methane fermenters, and you produce a lot of carbon dioxide gas and methane. So you're producing a lot of greenhouse gases by doing digestion. And you'll see some of these old big domes that used to be used. They're not as common as they once were before. And some wastewater plants will capture the gas and power the wastewater plant off the methane. Other wastewater plants will just burn the methane off. Why do we burn the methane off? And the reason why it's, quote, flared off, and that's called a flare, why it's a lit fire on top of this is the methane gas is burned off because we don't want that methane going into the atmosphere as a greenhouse gas. If you've got methane going off in the atmosphere and you got a lot of it, you're looking at maybe Clean Air Act violations and other things. So we don't want methane gas, greenhouse gases going off to the atmosphere. So we may have other ways of dealing with sludge. We may look at drying the sludge by land applying the sludge or applying the sludge over sand. So the water percolates down through the sand and gravel and can leave as you're going to the wastewater stream, the sludge will eventually dry out. And as it dries out over one of these sand filters, you can, now these aren't being used right now, but um, what you'll see the black stuff, as it dries out, you can actually rake off or use equipment to remove the dried material. And it gets flaky. You don't want it to get too thick or it gets to um, it takes too long to dry and gets too heavy and may not dry all the way through. So the bottom of it will stay like gelatinous and the top will form that dry crust that's easier to move. And you need to keep these things maintained. You don't want to dig into the sand too much or you have to replace it. Another option is the sludge press. And the waste goes through this and then through a series of conveyor belts where the belts wrapping it closer and closer and closer. Every time they get closer on these belts, it squeezes the water out. And Richmond uses a sludge press design. And the water gets squeezed out of it, and it's like cake batter, dry batter almost, like brownie mix coming out of this, that's so dry that it can actually be put into a dumpster and it looks like the black soil you would see like in night crawler containers if you're buying fishing bait. So that's all for the wastewater uh, plant. So how do we determine the flow? All these things are included in the video. So I'm not gonna spend much time on the review. They'll be on the uh, quizzes or exam type content for the course. So um, you've got the slides. We're gonna do uh, septic systems here in the next video. So I'm going to stop there.